Welcome back to the Valspod, where we're covering the Valspar Championship like a fresh coat of paint. Today's episode has ESPN.com senior golf writer Bob Herrig. Not only is Bob a great golf resource, he's a local Tampa Bay resident, so of course we have to pick his brain about the upcoming Valspar Championship. Take it away, Bob. I want to talk, just let's go around the national golf world. Um, you know, after coming, you know, we're situated between the Masters and the PGA Championship, which is a kind of an opportune time to talk about what guys are trying to work up to in mm-hmm. terms of the next major. Now, I will tell you, as a casual golf observer that I am versus you're the professional, um, I came out of the Masters and I said, I said to anybody that wanted to listen, hey, the, the times where a 40-year-old can win tournaments is over. It's all the big boppers. It's these new kids, these these rookie hot shots, Zalatoris that looks like he's like young enough to be my son, you know. And then Stuart Sink goes out at the RBC at Hilton Head and just destroys that course. So what am I to make of all this golf news? Yeah, well, you know, Stuart Sink finished twelfth at the Masters. He actually, um, you know, sort of quietly did that, and and on a golf course where he probably shouldn't have any success was able to – that actually earned himself a trip back to next year's Masters before he won Hilton Head. So um, I think the course, though, at Hilton Head makes the difference. It's not a bomber's course. It's a strategic course. you got to put it in the right spots. You're not going to just win with killing the ball off the tee. Now, he hits it plenty far, but it's more about accuracy and good second shots. It's not a long course. And I think there's a lot of courses like that still that, that sort of, you know, offer up an opportunity for some of the guys who aren't the long, young guys that you're talking about. And, uh, you know, we, we saw that again this week. You know, some of the guys who were close up there, Harold Varner's not particularly long off the tee, uh, Mav McNeely, you know, he's not a bomber per se. So, uh, you know, I just think there are spots where, where it can work. And when you get it all together like he's had it here recently, uh, it, it leads to winning. Yeah, what do, you, what, do you, what do you make of all the talk about distance and all the metrics I see now? So, again, I'm kind of on the outside of this professional golf coverage world. You you seem it's, – it almost reminds me of about five years ago in baseball where there was this massive upheaval of going to this metric-based, you know, computer Watson making decisions to pull Jake Snell in the seventh inning, you know. Mm-hmm. Um, do you see golf going that way? Do you think it's good or bad for the game? And just your thoughts about all the different metrics these guys use. Yeah, I have to admit, I'm pretty torn about it. Um, You know, what's going on is this quest for hitting as far as you can has sort of left us uh, wanting for, you know, the the ingenuity and the, and the thinking that goes into playing golf shots, you know, like, you know, that that's what gives some guys an advantage. I mean, as far as Tiger hit it, he still maneuvered, he thought his way around courses when he played in the President's Cup at Royal Melbourne the way he thought himself around there and, and hit to spots was beautiful. I mean, it was terrific how he handled it. And that's missing when you're doing some of this. And now all these, all this technological stuff that allows these guys to figure out what's the best launch angle, what's the best swing speed. You know, they've got these track man devices that tell them, give them this instant feedback and they're able to match up their incredible skills with equipment and tweak it, you know, to, to, to get the optimum results. You know, and, you know, it didn't used to be that way. You know, you used to take the clubs that you liked, the shafts that you liked, and you sort of dug it out of the dirt. You figured out your swing on the range. You might have had somebody look at it. You might have had a coach help you out. Now it's like they're trying to just almost be perfect with with the way they approach golf. And I'm not sure that's good. On the other hand, when they talk about rolling back the ball, I mean, what? you're not going to roll it back 10%. A guy who hits it 300, we don't want him to hit it 270. I mean, that's too much. So, well, is 2% or 3% even going to matter? You know, I, I, I do think maybe there's some things they can do with equipment to, to stop the, you know, the drivers from hitting it so far and shafts. They're, they're not going to let you have a shaft longer than 46 inches anymore, things like that. But, um, you know, it might have just gotten away from itself already. It might be too far down the road to rein it back in. Yeah, I feel like chasing technology is just almost a losing proposition. I do feel like the finesse that you talk about in terms of, you know, they talk about some of the changes to the golf game might be 
um, you know, the caddies can use the, the, the optic uh, distance markers and things. I, yeah, I'm, I'm with you. I, I feel like we get thrown into this category of sort of old guys shaking their fist at these technology, technological advances. And I, there is some beauty in, you know, the imperfection of things sometimes. So I, I'm with you. Now, before I get off this thought, I, you did mention Tiger Woods. And I can't move on. Mm -hmm. You're you're my guy. When when Tiger news pops, I go to your Twitter feed and see what's going on. Is anything going on with Tiger? Obviously, not Valspar related, but he contended here in 18 and hasn't been back since. Um, obviously, going through the injuries associated with the car accident in California. Do you have any updates? Yeah, you know it's <clears throat> it's really a shame because I think Tiger would have been playing at Innisbrook this year. I just had this feeling mm -hmm. that if everything were okay where it falls on the schedule a few weeks before the PGA, a few weeks after the Masters would have been perfect for him. He obviously liked it, almost won in 2018. As far as an update, um, the information vacuum is vast. It's very, very – it's just – it's been very dark in terms of getting any kind of word from them. I mean, really, all I know is what they said when – and really the last time they gave us any update – was uh, right after the Players' Championship when Tiger, had, you know, said that he had gotten home. He had come home to Florida. And there's been no official word since. Now, a few players at the Masters said they visited him. Um, I think that's a good sign that he allowed that. It shows that he didn't mind, you know, mind them seeing him. Uh, you know, and, and Rory McIlroy even suggested he expected to see something worse than what he saw. Now, I don't know exactly what that means in terms of his injuries, uh, I think it's pretty fair to say there's still a long way to go. Um, hopefully, maybe there will come a day where they tell us when he's off of crutches and starting to walk, uh, something like that. But that could be a while still. You know, it's a lot of healing. You know, obviously, all the indications are in addition to the right leg, the broken bones in his right leg, there were multiple fractures in his right foot and possibly his ankle. You know, that takes a while. And so, uh, you know, it's been, what, we're almost two months now. And uh, I think it's going to be a little while longer before we're going to get anything definitive. Man, I tell you what, 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 a, you know, we all, everybody from the Valspar championship up and down golf hopes Tiger gets back and, and gets well soon. I know you're part of that, man. I can't even imagine what the atmosphere would have been like if Tiger would have been able to work this into a schedule yeah. had the accident not happened. The 2018 atmosphere was just unbelievable here. Yeah, no question. It was probably the best it's ever been. I mean, that was, uh, you know, and you, you think back to that, it was only his fourth start after the spinal fusion surgery. You know, uh, you know he had had it in, this, in uh, April of 2017. He went six months before he could even pick up a club. So you're looking at September, October. And in March, you know, there he was with a chance. I mean, it was crazy. It was only his fourth tournament. And uh, it was, it was pretty, pretty impressive what he did. Um, to even, you know, to, to lose by one. Uh, and, uh, you know, if he, if he had made a putt or two here or there on that last round, he might have pulled it off. Man, he was close. I, you know, I was one of those naysayers that said, you know, we haven't seen him before. Copperhead is typically an interesting course to move or maneuver around. He may, may struggle with some of it because if you miss the fairways, it's pretty tough to work. And some of the shots that we were seeing him hit fresh off of injury were just astounding. So let's, let's, let's dive into the Valspar Championship, Bob. Again, guys, we're here with Bob Herrig. He's the senior golf writer for ESPN.com. Check out his work in his social media. Um, so, Bob, let's talk about the Valspar Championship. Again, it's almost like a hometown tournament for you and I. <laughs> yeah. Um, how, uh, so the Copperhead course, during all these media days and things, we hear that the players rank the Copperhead course at Ennisbrook very highly amongst all the courses that they play on the PGA schedule. Um, you, you've seen all these courses. I mean, how, how's it ranked for you? Yeah, it's great. I mean, it's, it's one of the best out there for a lot of reasons. One is it's not typical Florida. It's, it's not your typical Florida resort, flat sand water golf course. In fact, there's really not a lot of water on it. It's more like North Carolina. It's got some undulation. It's got pine trees. It's got, it's got a lot of movement. It, it you know, it flows. It, it, it requires these guys to think a little bit more off the tee. You can't just bomb a driver. And that's why I thought Tiger was well-suited to it because he didn't have to hit a lot of drivers. 
He could hit two irons off the tee if he wanted, or a five wood if that was in his bag, three wood, and and play the long iron game into green. So, um, you know, I think for those reasons, it, it's, it doesn't require you to shoot 18, 20 under to win. Many times it's a single digit under par score, eight, nine under wins. And uh, I think that's, you know, I think the guys like that. I think they like to be challenged uh, just outside of making a ton of putts, you know, and a lot of tour golf is, you know, you got to hit a lot of greens. You better shoot six under par every day. Well, at, at Innisbrook, you know, if you shoot 69 the first day, you're not out of it. If, even if you shoot par 71, you're not out of it. So, um, and you know, the undulation, the fifth and sixth holes, um, uh, you know, that's, that's, there's more ele- elevation change in this area right there than anywhere in the entire County. Uh, and then you get to the back nine, there's some more 16th holes, one of the best holes on, on the tour. So, uh, yeah, there's a lot to like about the Copperhead and when it's in great shape, man, it's tough. Yeah. And, and I know there's been a lot of talk this year, of, uh, when, when we're approaching the tournament that again, tees off on the 29th of April here in Ennisbrook at the Copperhead course. There's been a lot of talk about the change in schedule. We moved back in the year a bit. We're usually in March, at least the last few years. Now we're in May. Um, it necessitated some changes in how the course is prepared, definitely with like overseeding of the fairways and things. Do you expect the players to take – did players take notice of that when they think about their strategy heading in or – Somebody like Paul Casey who's won the last two, is he just going to play the same game he's played to be successful here? Yeah, my guess is you have to take that into account. I mean, it's a much different golf course from, from mid-March uh, to late April, early May, as you noted, the ryegrass. You know, in the fall, they put down ryegrass because the Bermuda starts to wean out as it gets a little cooler. The, you know, Bermuda is a summer hot grass. Well, it's starting to get hot now. So that Bermuda is coming back. And what it does is it fights back against the rye. That was, that's been put down mostly to make it look pretty. You know, rye grass is green. It makes it look, it's, you, know, in the, you know, in the wintertime, if, if they don't put that down, the, the, the rough and the fairways will turn brown. You know, Mother Nature takes over because it's, it's not the growing season. So they put that down to make it look nice. And that holds really well into March. Uh, it's sort of what Augusta does, frankly. They put down ryegrass in the fall, and then by the time April rolls around, you know, that course is really, really good. And then as, as you get past it, that rye is going to die off. Yeah. So we're going to be in that position now where that's happening. And how that impacts it, I'm not sure. Um, it typically means it will probably play easier. They're going to have to put some water down uh, to, uh, you know, if it's not raining at all, to make sure that the Bermuda comes in okay. Uh, and that leads to softer conditions. So, uh, you know, it'll be interesting to see how it plays, but all the players understand that they get that. I mean, the tournament from a agronomical standpoint is probably better in March than it is in late April, early May, but from a schedule standpoint, this is terrific. You know, it's going to be three weeks before the PGA championship guys are going to be getting geared up again to, to get ready for the next major. Yeah, I hear you. Great insight from you, Bob. I, I really appreciate it. So let's let's talk pragmatically about the guys that are going to be here in a couple of weeks at the 2021 Valspar Championship. So I, I sort of group them into two categories as a casual golf observer. The first is kind of the eight, what I'll call the A number one players that even the casual fan knows. DJ, um, mm-hmm. Paul Casey is our two-time back-to-back champion. Uh, now we have Justin Thomas committed. Of those guys, who do you see playing very well, if not all of them? Well, I certainly could see all of them playing well there. Um, I kind of like uh, uh, I kind of like Justin Thomas, though. You know, it's 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 the type of he. If anything holds him back, it's putting, and it's the type of course where you don't have to make a ton of birdies. And he's such a good iron player. I mean, so is DJ. I mean, they all are. But uh, Justin Thomas is really good at that part of the game, and he hasn't played the tournament in a little while. I think he's kind of probably psyched up to, you know, to get back after it. Um, You know, Dustin Johnson's an interesting case in that a couple years ago he only played because, you know, the tour has this rule where if you haven't played an event in four years, you have to – excuse me, you have to add an event once a year that you haven't played in at least four years. And the only way you get out of that is if you play 25 times, and a lot of these guys don't. 
And so he needed a new event and he played it and he liked it. He almost won in 2019. And so look, he doesn't have to do that now. And yet he decided to come back. So uh, that's kind of a, a, uh, a neat, a neat thing about how that rule has some, has some impact. And, uh, but you know, Patrick Reed's done well uh, yeah. at, at, at Innisbrook. There's a lot of good, a lot of good, obviously Casey has won the last two times. So, uh, you know, those guys are strong ball strikers. It usually suits them. Yeah. And I, and I, I'm going through the other players here and, you know, my name keeps getting stuck. My eyes keep getting stuck at Billy Horschel for some reason. I just, I feel like he's a Florida guy. Like I remember seeing him at 2019's tournament, just draining practice putt after practice putt from any distance. And I thought this guy is, I don't even know who he is at the time. And he's really great. But then I saw his kind of master's debacle. and I'm, ah, <laughs> I don't know. Yeah. He's kind of emotional, right? So he's, he, uh, and he even admitted he let it get away from there a little bit. Um, you know, it's a frustrating game sometimes. I'm good with that if you come out right away and admit it, which he did, you know, yeah. and he just won the match play a couple weeks before. Um, he's been playing well. I think he's a guy that they need to look at for the Ryder Cup, frankly. You know, they, they need a fiery guy. They need some, some new blood. And uh, he's good at that style. And, uh, and he, you know, he's, he's – He's not a terribly long hitter. He gets the most out of his physical abilities. Kind of, I kind of, uh, I kind of like him. Uh, you know, when he's on. The thing with him is he plays a lot, and so you never quite know. You're not going to have it every single week, and uh, so it'll be interesting to see how how he shows up and fares. Yeah. Okay. So Bob Herrick here, senior writer, ESPN. Check out his work. Bob, I've got to get you on record. Two, 2021 Valspar Championship tees off on the 29th of April. Somebody's going to be hoisting a trophy on the 2nd of May. Who you got? Yeah, well, you know, my track record in these things is awful. Um, <laughs> it's impossible. It's right. It is, really. Picking one guy out of 150 or whatever. If I were any good at this, All right, I'd you move, can tell me, move to you, Vegas. You can give me one guy, but then tell him, tell him, what, tell him why he would win. So you can be wrong well, on the guy, but maybe it's, you're going to tell me <laughs> chipping or something. Well, well I like I, – for the reasons I mentioned earlier, I like Justin Thomas. You know, obviously he's one of the best in the world. He can move the ball. He likes the type of course like this. He can hit his irons great. It's a second-shot course. Solid irons is the, is the key. It's not about making eight birdies around, which he can obviously do too. It's more about getting the most out of it, turning a 71 into 67. That's, that's sort of his game. So and I think he's going to be sort of geared up to be, to, to be getting things back together again. All right. Well, hey, we appreciate your time. And like I said, I, I, everybody, whether you're you know, a very serious golf watcher or like a weekend warrior that can't hit a shot like me, Bob Herrick from ESPN <laughs> is the person you have to plug into to make sure you're reading all about not only Tiger Woods, but everything around golf because there's lots of golf without Tiger even. All right, Bob, thanks for joining us. I'm Tobin Walsh. Thank you for joining the Valspod. Look for our future episodes and follow along at at the good, bad dad on social media platforms or at Valspar Champ or at Innisbrook. We'll see you next time.